That's David Graeber, uh, author of Debt, The First 5,000 Years, and David Harvey, um, author of our new book, Rebel Cities, which we're launching today. Um, and I just really want to say that first I was really proud to, to publish uh, Rebel Cities and to co-host this event tonight. Um, we first have been around for like 40 some years and have been talking about revolution for about that long, which is much longer than my own lifespan. Um, and so it's really exciting to see revolution actually happen this year. And one thing that we sort of like to tell people about Rebel Cities is that we had been begging David Harvey uh, for a book on urban revolt, an urban manifesto, for years. Uh, and he finally came to us with Rebel Cities and then, just before we were about to go to press with the book, uh, the revolution happened, and right in our own backyard. So, um, I think David was in Chile at the time, uh, marching in the streets of Santiago with Chile student revolutionaries. For real, I think. <laughs> and somehow he still found time to Draft, draft us a piece on uh, OWS, which is happening at the time. Uh, and that, you know, we got it, we edited it really, really quickly, and, you know, sent the book to press. And that's the final chapter of the book. Um, and I don't really know the publishing history of Debt, uh, David Graeber's book, but I, I imagine uh, his publishers, Melville House, maybe sort of feel this, uh, had similar feelings after. Um, working on this gigantic, impressively thorough book uh, for a really long time, only to find that debt had become probably one of the most salient uh, concepts or issues of our current political debate. You know, student debt, mortgage debt, federal debt, and austerity. Uh, so let me introduce our guests. Uh, David Graeber is an anthropologist at Goldsmiths, University of London, and a longtime anarchist activist. Uh, in just 2011, he was at the London tuition protests and, of course, in New York at the birth of Occupy, and many consider him one of the leading thinkers behind Occupy. I don't know if you like people saying that about you, but too late. Um, <laughs> One. <laughs> David Harvey teaches here at the CUNY Grad Center and is the author of many books, including Social Justice in the City, The Limits to Capital, A Brief History of Neoliberalism, Spaces of Global Capitalism, and A Companion to Marxist Capital. Uh, and of course, he's long been associated with uh, the Right to the City movement, and many consider him one of the leading contemporary thinkers behind Right to the City. Um, so before we begin, I just want to thank our friends at Melville House um, for their help in organizing this event and also manning the door, um, to Haymarket for selling books for us here tonight, and to uh, Padmini and the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics uh, for hosting us. Um, the center is an interdisciplinary forum that supports radical scholarship and activism here at the CUNY Grad Center and also hosts numerous public events and lectures around themes like uprisings, which was the theme for 2012. So please check them out, join their mailing list. Um, they put on really wonderful talks, ranging from people like Aaron Daddy Roy to Christian Parenti. Um, oh, and just one more thing before we start the show. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, Ross Perlin, author of Internation, will be here. <laughs> He is one fan. Um, <laughs> we'll be here at the Grad Center in conversation with Stanley Aronowitz uh, to launch, launch the paperback edition of the book. And oh yeah, also thanks to our wonderful intern, Mike Bacall. This is his last week. He's been wonderful. We'll be sad to, to miss him. We'll be sad to see him go and miss him. <laughs> um, and on Friday, we're, we're launching our other book. It started in Wisconsin. Uh, dispatches from the front lines of the new labor protest, and that's going to be at the Brecht Forum with editor Paul Buell and the new art and illustration collective, uh, Occupy Comics. Um, we also have a bunch of other events this week, uh, or in this next two weeks, with uh, Mary Kay Wilmers, longtime editor of London Review Books, Louis Lapham of Lapham's Quarterly, 
uh, with A.L. Weissman and with the editors of uh, Occupy, Scenes from Occupied America. So you can get more info at the Haymarket book table outside later. Um, oh, also, uh, the question period later, uh, we've been handing out uh, little index cards. So if you guys have a question for either of the Davids, um, please write it out and we'll collect them after the talk and pass it on to them. So let's start the show. David Harvey. Okay. Let me uh, first correct the, the record. <laughs> um, uh, I've been on sabbatical all this year and I left in mid-September and about a week or so after I left, they went and occupied Wall Street. Um, I, I was on sabbatical, uh, not in the streets of Chile, I was uh, living out in the countryside about 500 kilometers south of Buenos Aires, 10 miles from the nearest Wi-Fi cafe, um, and uh, you know, feeding chickens and doing things like that. And my single observation from the whole year would be this, that the idiocy of rural life is really so much more preferable than the idiocy of American political life. <laughs> Conversations with chickens make a lot of sense. Conversations with the Republican establishment and all the rest of it make no sense whatsoever. And we seem to be in this senseless world. And I hope that tonight we can try and recoup uh, some sense uh, in terms of political strategies and political thinking uh, around how, how an oppositional movement, an anti-capitalist movement, can be created and how it can uh, begin uh, to flourish. Uh, the book was uh, written using, as often happens, various articles and putting them together and then reshaping some of them and rethinking some of them, but uh, I think the key chapter, uh, which I was trying to add on and expand upon at the end, is the idea of reclaiming the city for anti-capitalist struggle. And for a long time now, I've been, of course, working on the whole kind of question of urbanization and the struggles that occur around urbanization. And on the left, in general, this tends to have been rendered rather peripheral from our thinking. Uh, I guess one of the legacies of Marx and Marxism is to start to think about the proletariat as the major agency of change, major agent of historical transformation. And the proletariat is largely looked upon as being the industrial proletariat, with maybe agricultural and mining and so on uh, mixed in but it's been a very work-based kind of idea. When, of course, there are a lot of struggles over urban life and urban living. And very frequently they're called sort of urban social movements and they're about rights, they're not about you know, class. And, and so there's a tendency to have a sort of schism uh, between thinking about what's going on in the city and what's going on in terms of the organization of uh, a labor force uh, in, in struggle with, with, with capital. And it's always seemed to me that uh, we should pay much more attention to the question of uh, who produces and reproduces urban life. And if we change the idea of production away from you know, the project production of widgets in a factory or the production of automobiles or the production of coal or something like that to the question of who produces the city and who reproduces the city, who produces spatial organization, then you start to get a very different definition of who is the proletariat and what that proletariat is about. And for me, of course, having done a great deal of work on what happened in Second Empire Paris and what produced the Paris Commune, it was pretty clear to me that it was not an industrial proletariat that produced uh, the Commune. Uh, certainly there were artisans heavily involved, uh, but many of the people who were involved were the stonemasons, the builders, uh, and many other uh, people who were actually supporting uh, urban life. 
and to claim that the, the, the commune, Paris Commune was a uniquely proletarian event uh, seemed to me to suggest that we re needed a much broader definition even back then of who was or was not uh, the proletariat. So that is, if you like, one of the first ideas that seemed to me very important. But when you took that and you started to look at the whole history of urban-based struggles, you see a whole series of urban-based revolts, revolutions, rebellions, of which the Paris Commune was just one. And all of them had, I think, a certain significance historically in terms of what happened and, and, and why. In this country, for example, there was the Seattle General Strike of 1919 that most people don't talk about, but it was an urban event. Uh, and it was, about, it was about the city. Uh, Cordoba in 1969. Uh, there was the Shanghai Commune back in the 20s and again in, 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 the, in the 60s. Uh, there have been event, the Petrograd Soviet. I mean, you just sort of go on. And beyond that, what you see is it's not only single cities that are involved, but frequently whole networks of cities become involved. If you look back at the revolutions of 1848, what you would see, it wasn't only Paris. It was Paris, it was uh, Frankfurt, it was Milan, it was Vienna, it was Warsaw. Uh, if you look at 1968, uh, it wasn't simply Paris. Again, it was you know, Chicago, it was Paris, it was Mexico City, it was Bangkok. I mean, and, and, and in recent times, one of the events which struck me as, as very significant, but everybody forgets about, was the events on February the 15th, 2003, when simultaneously in some 200 cities around the world, there were huge demonstrations against the prospect of a war with Iraq, with something like three million people on the streets of Rome, two million in Madrid, a million and a half, maybe two million in Barcelona, a million and a half in, in Britain. How many that were tried to get in New York, we never know, because Bloomberg said you couldn't march anywhere, and nobody knew who could, who could get out of the subways because everything was jammed. jammed. I mean, the urban network is, is, a, is a political institution and a political, contains a set of political possibilities. And if you look at least recent events, we see the uprising in Egypt, of course, which concentrates in Cairo and on Tahrir Square. We see events like uh, Madison, uh, Wisconsin. We see uh, what is going on in Syria right now. What is it, where's the revolt located? It's in cities like Homs and so on. And what we see in Latin America or events like those in Cochabamba, those in El Alto, and, and those uh, in, which did not succeed, probably, like Oaxaca. So what, what we're looking at is, 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 a, is a history of tremendous struggles which have had an urban focus. And one of the questions which then follows is, this, is, this, is the city simply a site where it just happens, the class struggle unfolds? Well, there's some truth to that idea. But nevertheless, the qualities of the city play a very important role in exactly how that revolt unfolds. I mean, one of the big stories about Haussmann in Paris was that he rebuilt the boulevards to try to curb the prospect of another revolution like what happened in 1848. He was notably unsuccessful in that. But the redesign of many American cities after the urban revolts of the 1960s in this country, which again was many cities involved. The urban design became important because what we in effect found ourselves was highways were neatly engineered to protect the downtown high value property from potentially restive populations. There were moats constructed, if you like, around the citizens of, 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 of capital. So, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a sense that the urban has to be controlled, and urban control becomes terribly important on that side, but also that the urban can be used by organizing and mobilizing neighborhoods around kind of collective forms of struggle. And then it seemed to me that when you went, actually went look back and looked at the most successful histories of, of factory-based struggles, the best ones nearly always worked because there was very, very strong mobilization in the surrounding communities. And it's very impressive in Argentina. Many of the occupied factories have gone out of their way to turn themselves into neighborhood institutions, cultural institutions, educational institutions, 
So when the owners come back and try to recuperate the factory by, or take the machinery or something like that, everybody in the neighborhood turns out and pre prevents it. So when you have a massive support from the population around and that unity between what's going on in the factory and what's going on in the living space, struggles work much better. But the left has often not been prepared to acknowledge that, that underlying unity. And so one of the themes I wanted to, wanted to suggest was we should really be thinking better about how to put all of those elements together in terms of an organized attempt to create an alternative to the kind of capitalist world in which we, we currently live. And it also turns out that there's a lot of exploitation, of course, that occurs in the living space. I mean, one of the ways in which the bourgeoisie survives is it, it can concede wage concessions to workers. And then when the workers take their wage packets home, they suddenly find it all disappears because the landlords steal it back, or the merchants steal it back, or today, far more likely to be the credit institutions and the banks and the financiers steal it back. Capital doesn't care where it realizes the surplus value. Does it realize it in the workplace or does it realize it in, in the living space? And increasingly, we have an economy of dispossession, which is working in the living space, which is compensating for the fact that they're not managing to make too much in the way of extracting surplus value out of the, 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 the workspaces. So all of this suggests to me that we should be really thinking seriously about these, these, these underlying unities and, and thinking about the organizational forms uh, that we can, we can build. And out of that comes, uh, I think, uh, a, a sense that in building those organizational forms, we might want to think about the question of how do you organize a whole city? How do you organize it as a bastion of class struggle? How do you then organize a whole series of cities so they become a network of cities? This actually was how capital broke free of feudalism. Things like the Hanseatic League. Well, imagine if you had a League of Socialist Cities, what that would look like. Wonderful idea, you know, wonderful image. But we never really think in those terms. And, and I'm kind of saying, well, we should be thinking and imagining in those terms and working towards the possibility that this is a way to go. The other thing about organizing a whole city is it moves us up a notch in the scale problem. We have a lot of organizational forms right now that look very good from the standpoint of organizing very small scale units. You know, the factory occupations, community organizations, and things of that sort. When you start to think about organizing a whole city, you have to think about organizational forms that are not simply horizontal, but they also have to be vertical and they have to be, you know, integrated with each other and we have to think about what's the relationship between politics at different scales within the political system. And so from that standpoint also, it seems to me that we need to think about organizational forms which can actually respond to what seemed to me to be the crucial need right now, which is to find an alternative to the capitalist forms of urbanization, and as I put it in the book, I think our task in some ways is to try to build a socialist city on the ruins of a capitalist urbanization process which has been highly destructive, highly destructive of social relations, highly destructive environmentally, highly destructive in terms of the possibility of having a genuinely political kind of life, highly destructive of the urban commons, highly destructive uh, of many of the institutional forms that once existed to give some sort of coherence to uh, what the city was or could be about. So those are some of the general themes that I tried to, to broach uh, at the end there. And it's in that context that I see Occupy Wall Street as beginning to sort of move as many movements have through and across uh, urban institutions and urban, urban life and start to organize so that people are, to, are working on the, on the foreclosures, some are working on the student debt, there are many aspects of this all being brought together. And, and, and I think the big question for us is can we package that in such a way to say this is how we are going to move towards creating an alternative to a capitalist mode of production which has reached, I think, its end point, uh, its shelf life is out 
and and it's uh, it, and what we're seeing, I think, is you know today I read that uh, formerly Europe is now back in recession, Britain is back in recession, and they're saying the double dip recession has arrived. Well, believe you me, we're going to be in a triple dip recession very soon, and this is kind of the future that we're facing. So we've really got to start thinking big time <laughs> about alternatives right now. So with that, let me just turn it over to David and let David sort of talk a little bit about uh, his perspective on some of this thing, these things, and particularly his, his much closer involvement and with, oh. I think with uh, Occupy Wall Street uh, and where that has gone and where it's going. Okay. Um, is the microphone working? Can yeah. people hear me? Oh, good. Um, well, I, thanks so much for having me here. By the way, I, I, I apologize for the, the silly costume. Um, I actually, it, it, it's not totally an act of whimsy. I was actually at an action earlier um, in Union Square where we were ceremonially destroying a giant loan statement um, and declaring a biblical jubilee. And you know, the Reverend Billy came out in his preacher outfit. And I had to have something to match it. So I found this old um, odd fellow's costume that I picked up at a used place in Austin. Um, got a matching hat, and you know, it's sort of Roman themes seem to work. Uh, but I had to rush here from there. Uh, but yes, um, I have actually uh, been involved uh, sometimes more deeply, sometimes less, um, sometimes actually acting, sometimes writing about it uh, for, well, since the summer uh, when we were first trying to put together the occupation at Zuccotti Park. And you know, between activism and constantly having to write, one of the things that I never ever get to do is, is to read a book. <laughs> there really isn't any time for it. And, and I say, I'm really grateful for events like this because I kind of have to read the book, right? <laughs> if I, if I um, come to an event like this, so I got to read it and I'm very excited. Um, I, I think it's a, a really wonderful um, work which throws out all sorts of ideas and challenges uh, that I think we are trying to think, beginning to think about in practical ways in the movement itself. I mean, as you probably know, the situation of Occupy Wall Street, um, we had this kind of moment of national effervescence. So this is kind of remarkable to me because I was involved in the global justice movement um, and I was one of those diehards who was never willing to admit that it was over. Um, we, we kept on going after 9-11, after 2003 in Miami, the repression got particularly intense. But you know, every year there was another thing where we said to ourselves, no, this is it, we're back now, we're back now, it's gonna be the same thing. Refigurative politics, direct democracy, direct action, it's gonna take, it's gonna become contagious. Um, and you know, every year we kind of got ourselves uh, convinced it was gonna happen and then it never did. And at some point, I mean, I, I think you really get to the point where you're, you don't even really believe it's gonna happen, you're just telling yourself this. Your life is kind of organized around this thing that you don't really believe it's actually possible on some level anymore. You just, and then it happened, you know? Um, there we were, and, and uh, we did this Occupy Wall Street thing, which was something that was kind of handed us by ad busters that threw out this idea, just as I had many times before, incidentally, um, and, and just sort of let it drift, because I guess they had this idea that you just put something out on the internet and it kind of happens on the internet, um, of course, which isn't really true. Um, a lot of people sort of, decided we would use this as, an ex as a sort of excuse more than anything else to create a movement based on principles of direct democracy, general assemblies, and suddenly it took. It just like, after three weeks, you know, I, could, I really couldn't believe it. I have to wake, and wake up and pinch myself. And a lot of us had the same experience, like there's 500 occupations across America? What, what happened? Um, why did it work? And I've spent a lot of time thinking about why that is. and, and um, and it's interesting, I, I think I'll talk about what happened, well, I should talk also about what's happened since. As we know, there was a, a huge outpour. Suddenly the media was actually talking about what was happening, which was shocking. Um, I've been dealing with the American media on and off for 10 years. And um, I remember the first time I did an interview with Canadian media before a direct action in Quebec City. And I looked at the uh, piece that came out and I said, oh my God, they wrote down what I actually said. 
I, that had never happened to me before in America. Uh, the American media is just almost systematically hostile to movements like this. And there's a brief window where they seemed to open up to it. They were even willing to admit the police violence because, you know, Gandhian strategies, which is what we were basically pursuing, where you show that no matter how nonviolent you are, the authorities will react with vicious violence if you challenge um, certain principles. Uh, and it was very hard to get that, do that in America because the last people really did it on a mass scale successfully were the civil rights movement um, because the media just won't report it that way. The media can't report officially sanctioned police behavior uh, as violence, no matter what they do. Uh, but suddenly they did. Um, there, the famous pepper spray incident, the Brooklyn Bridge arrests, there was, um, and something very interesting happened. Um, on the ground, tactically, we pretty much won. The first eviction from Zuccotti Park, we managed to stop it, Bloomberg had to block down. A month later, something happened and there was this wave, a coordinated wave of evictions across America, affected through extraordinary brutality. Um, and for one reason or another, the media sort of just dropped the story. Um, we don't know how these things happen. But um, there, what it's led to is a real split. I mean, the official narrative is that there were all these dissensions with the NOWS. And you know, there was some of that, partly because people were in shock and thing, uh, when you don't have an immediate camp to run. Um, all these well, tensions that had existed before sort of come out. We went through a couple months of, of great recrimination, but we bounced out of it. Um, but when we showed up again, we discovered that, um, in fact, in a lot of ways, we'd sunk much deeper roots. Um, I mean, most people don't know things, we have things like Occupy Farms. I think there's 15 occupied farms in New York State now. Um, we have an uh, incredible level uh, and diversity of different projects from Occupy Foreclosed Homes to um, library projects to medical projects. I mean, anything you can possibly imagine. We really are at work trying to reinvent another society. And it's been deepening and broadening. Um, actually, our, our slogan, um, it's a little off color, but I've always liked it. It seems most appropriate to what happened is the fuck us and we multiply. Um, <laughs> all over the way, we're having new versions of OWS and new manifestations. Um, yet, what, in the spring, as we're reemerging, we're facing an enormous level of, of repression, at, which for some reason is no longer a news story. I mean, um, so the most critical thing um, I think that's happened, that's changed Occupy Wall Street, is there's a slow um, transformation of class alliances. Liberal organizations and well-meaning liberal people got involved in mass numbers in the original occupations. In fact, a lot of these people didn't even understand that they were joining a group that was founded basically on anarchist principles of direct democracy and direct action, which is fine. Um, but when it came to the inevitable police repression, there has been a kind of a split. I always say that, um, well, there's a kind of traditional terms of alliance between the liberals and radicals in American social movements, um, which is essentially that we create, you know, we the radicals create a fire on your left um, so that you become relevant again in your various reformist projects, um, you know, people will listen to them, um, since you seem like the more moderate alternative to us. And so we create a fire to your left to make you relevant, and you keep us out of jail. Um, so basic civil liberties um, issues uh, is, is what the central role of the larger NGOs and groups like Move On and um, that, that got heavily involved ought to be, at least from, from our perspective. And, and there was a, there's a colossal failure in that regard. Um, you know, once the violence began in earnest, it was not made into a national issue. Uh, most people are not aware, for example, I'm just gonna throw something out. Um, in Egypt, uh, in November, a lot of people heard of this, when they started reoccupying Tahrir Square, um, security forces tactics suddenly shifted to a sort of calculated campaign of sexual violence. Um, not only were they beating people, but like they first smelly like, groping women and, um, do, uh, in, and stripping people. In, when we started trying uh, our reoccupation of Zuccotti Park on March 17th, and continually since the Union Square occupation, now the occupation on Wall Street itself, um, suddenly the American police started doing the same thing. 
um, we hadn't really had reports of this, any significant reports of this earlier, but suddenly, you know, we have these incidents where they're like systematically grabbing women's breasts, and um, I have a friend with five times in one day, with five different officers. Um, there is a sort of campaign, uh, of, and not to, uh, another a friend of mine, this happened to at Zuccotti Park, and she sort of yelled at the cops, called her pervert, so they took her behind the lines and broke her wrists. I mean, this is the kind of level of violence that we've been talking about right here in the city. And I think that um, a lot of our former allies just are horrified at making a case about this or even confronting the fact that this is going on. Because it tells us something about what kind of society we've really lived in, the degree of militarization and securitization of er even everyday life in a city like New York. Um, so this, as a result, a lot of our attention has been placed on issues of police brutality. But as a result, also, we there's been a shift of alliances, which in a way I think is actually kind of healthy. Um, we are turning much more to alliances with groups that know a lot about this sort of treatment and know how to, um, how to deal with it. We've been dealing much more with unions, uh, and also especially radical groups within unions, of which there is a burgeoning number of um, or gr grassroots groups within larger unions that are experimenting with horizontal decision making and um, more radical democratic forms. Um, we've been talking a lot with immigrant groups. Um, May Day, which will be happening quite soon, is um, going to be, a, in some ways, a, a repeat of the famous um, Day Without an Immigrant, um, May Day mobilizations, which can frame, among other things, the Day Without the 99%. But we also, so we've been working with immigrant groups, but we've also got a lot of unions on board, which is actually a real historical shift in America, because it's going to mark the first time that really large number of American unions are celebrating Labor Day on the day that the rest of the world celebrates it. I think that's uh, symbolically very important. Um, so this is where Occupy Wall Street is at. Um, we're really at a convergent point where there's a deeper turning to communities. We're talking about things like workplace occupations. We're talking about creating community general assemblies and, uh, um, and councils. We're experimenting with a broad range of, of, of forms of self-organization. And this is exactly the moment, I think, that thinking about theory is really important. And um, I think David Harvey's book is really helpful here because one problem we have had, um, and it's almost inevitable in a way, is that social move, it's like the generals are always fighting the last war. The, the, the social theory that becomes identified with a social movement of social mobilization tends to be that drawn from the last round. Um, so that classically in the globalization movement, the ultra globalization movement of around 2000, 2001, the sort of theoretical works that really got pulled out and were seen as being the sort of embodiment of the movement were Hart and Negri's um, empire and autonomous theory that really came out of the 1970s in Italy. Um, at the moment, we're having a resurgence of, of stuff, in a way, um, my own uh, writings from around 2000 in some quarters are being developed in the same way for a movement, movement 10 years later. Um, and it might be nice for once in history to actually create um, theory relevant to this moment rather than the last time around. Um, I think that Reconsidering the role of the city is really critical there. I mean, we're, we're at a moment in Occupy Wall Street where we're sitting down and we're trying to deepen our own theoretical perspectives. We're, we're actually calling, we're talking about uh, creating a series of conversations, open conversations about visions, about organizational questions, about you know, the very kind of questions of scale um, that David raises in the book, and um, which we haven't had the opportunity, unfortunately, to handle practically, but we'd like to get to the point where we will. Um, now, it strikes me that the basic, one of the most important insights, one well, thing that I pulled out of this, it really st stayed with me as, as, as critical, is your, your discussion of the role of the proletariat and labor and the creation of the city. Because we're really stuck with an old-fashioned paradigm about work, it seems to be. And the composition, the class composition, if I can use uh, the term, that we're seeing emerging in Occupy Wall Street is really interesting in that regard. Because you know, here we have a series of cities in largely um, deindustrialized sections of America, where you know, we still have a working class, but we have class alliances that look really different than anything that we've seen um, 
particularly at any period I'm aware of. Um, if you think, think about it this way, uh, the TWU, TWU, the Transit Workers Union, um, is one of our, the strongest allies of the Occupy Wall Street movement. Um, so much so that the TWU is actually still suing the uh, New York Police Department for commandeering their buses to take away the people arrested in the Brooklyn Bridge protests. Um, TWU has been amazing. Um, but if you think about the occupation from Zuccotti Park, uh, it was you know, the, the single largest group of people who spearheaded that initial occupation were young people who were either students or recently had been students, saddled with enormous student loan debt. Um, now, the reason why this is significant is, well, the plight of a group of indebted ex-college students is not the sort of thing that really would have spoken immediately to the heart of transit workers through most of American history. Why is it that right now there's this strong alliance and identification? Um, you know, 10 years ago it would not have been the case, like 40 years ago it would hardly have been the case. I mean, I still talk uh, to people who are veterans of Wall Street protests in, say, 1970, um, the late 60s and early 70s, when you know construction workers would come in like with two by fours and physically attack them. Um, so the class alliance has really profoundly changed here, and um, we need to understand why and how that's happening. Um, one reason I think it's happening has to do with the nature of capitalism itself and and, and forms of surplus extraction. Um, I think most of us are aware of the phenomenon of financialization of capitalism. At this point, only 16% of corporate profits are derived from industry, and even that's wildly overstated because that includes, for, um, for example, the profits of um, General Motors, which at this point are largely come from their financial division um, and not from the actual production of cars at all. Um, the vast majority, or the single largest share, comes from finance, but um, I think it's something like 30% of profits comes from the fire sector at this point, at least. 40, 40 at this 40. point, yeah. And the interesting thing we don't know is, is how much of the average American's income is actually directly appropriated in that way. Um, this struck me as profound um, when I started looking at uh, trying to get the numbers that we can't. I mean, th there's no one place where you can find these numbers tabulated. You can get um, the amount that are paid in loans, you can get the amount, but it usually doesn't include things like late fees, which often come to 50%, especially with student loans, um, various fees, penalties, service charges. Um, if you tabulate it all, the closest I could come made it sound like it was about 18%. Well, that's really significant. Um, and especially when you consider that is wildly disproportionately uh, distributed according to class, race, um, and other demographic, demographic factors or income in general. Um, so that, you know, there are people from 40% of their, in, uh, a lot of families in America, 40% of their income goes to student loans alone. Um, if you look at what happened in 2008, for example, um, you find that the actual total amount of indebtedness and the amount of people's income that they were paying in loans actually plummeted um, very, very quickly. It's one of the sharpest drops I've ever seen on any chart, actually, um, because everybody who actually could get deleverage themselves and get themselves out of debt seemed to be doing so. People with mortgages, uh, people with credit card debt were trying to liquidate it. Um, the two types of debt that people really don't seem to have been able to get out of were precisely student loans, which went up rather sharply during this period, and things like subprime mortgages, um, and, and the sort of debts owed by the working poor, who are, of course, inordinately dependent on the incredibly extravagant um, rates of interest that you get from payday loans um, and other extremely parasitical, what's the word, predatory um, lending. So all of a sudden, the working poor and the college student are in a rather structurally similar position. They're the people who can't pull themselves out of the grip of Wall Street. So a movement that highlights, essentially, um, the degree to which our economy has becoming the profit base of Wall Street itself has become a sort of system whereby they take money directly from you redistribute it to politicians who allow them to write the regulations, which supposedly regulate the corporations, which then give them the right to take even more money from you. Um, particularly speaks to both those sections of the population. Um, but I th and I think, you know, it makes us question 
very nature of what's happening to capitalism itself. And obviously, when I was in college, I learned a very simplistic version of the sort of Terry Anderson version of capitalism versus feudalism, where um, you know, capitalism extracts their surplus indirectly through the wage, and when you take the surplus through, um, what was it, uh, juro-political means, that's called feudalism. Um, I think it's a simplistic thing to say that it's turning into a more feudalistic form of capitalism. Rent taking has always been an element. But there's been a shift within capitalism rather remarkably, um, which explains the changing natures of class alliances. And we need a theory that can, that can take that on. I think that reimagining labor itself is, um, we really do have the shackles of very old fashioned notions. Um, and I think one of the most wonderful things about the book is how effectively it challenges that. If you think of making a city, what is this productive labor? Labor of production, you know, when we think of labor, we think of production as being the paradigm for labor. But most of the labor that we spend is in maintaining things. Um, you know, a building is a beautiful example. Is it produced? It's produced, it's uh, maintained, it's changed, it's transformed. Um, and, oh. The paradigms for labor that we use are very much built on examples that Marx used, not because he thought that factory labor was the major form of labor, but because he was taking certain political um, economic, no, he's not writing a, a work of political economy, he's writing a critique of political economy. He's taking certain assumptions uh, from the political economist's day, saying, well, you know, even if this is true, we can demonstrate that the system is profoundly contradictory and will ultimately destroy itself. Uh, but the problem is we then take often, you know, take that as if that he is um, presenting to us as the literal truth of what's going on. There's always, labor has always been a much more complex thing. Um, and I think that the social composition of current social movements can only be explained by about a, 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 type, a change in the nature of labor that we don't completely understand. And I think that um, the way that it's largely been taken on theoretically um, has been coming out of that Italian autonomous tradition, which I think gets it half right. I think that, that they're profoundly right when they say that much of the creative, you know, capitalism doesn't really create anything. Um, to a large degree, it appropriates um, the creativity of the working classes, and not just in the, um, way that, in, in factory production, but on every level. I think um, your example, the creation of urban neighborhoods, um, is a beautiful example. In a lot of ways, all, all the best things in modern life are the creations of the working class, but they're the creations of the working class when they're not working. Um, you know, everything from shish kebab stands to rock and roll, you know, are essentially working class creations during the hours they have off. Um, but um, even more than that, I think that well, to really understand what's happening, we need to, I would say, um, rather than the sort of rhetoric of immaterial labor biopower, which I don't want to get into, but I think is profoundly problematic, the, uh, the, the, the most useful theoretical way to approach this might be to combine David Harvey's insights into the nature of the city and the production of urban environment with the feminist tradition, which I do think that, that um, we need to pay more attention to, it because they've been handling these questions for a lot longer than anyone. Um, and you know, the, what form of labor do we think of as paradigmatic? To some degree, it's not simply, uh, one problem with the framing of these things in Marxist theory is that production is assumed to be the production of material objects, and the production of human beings is sort of sidelined as reproduction, um, which in a subtle way sort of suggests that it's almost biological in comparison. Um, I've always disliked that phrase, reproduction. I like to think of it rather as the production of human beings. So I think alongside that idea of the production of urban environment, we're also producing each other. Um, which is, again, a process which cannot actually be reduced to the standard categories of political economy. And I think that it will be necessary, if we have any understanding of what's happening across America, why this movement seems to have coalesced and, 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 and taken on the breadth and depth that it has, we need to think about that in terms of the confluence between debt extraction and the creation of human beings. Um, I will give an example. I was, um, I don't know if people are familiar with the, we are the 99% Tumblr page. Um, it's a page where people are invited, largely people who 
are too busy working to actually take part in occupations to sort of put in their, their own contribution by taking pictures of themselves, the little signs where they tell their life story, their situation, it always ends with we are the, I am the 99%. Um, now, somebody did a word count analysis of the little statements, and some of them were really touching and moving, of, of the depredations of indebtedness, the um, problems, uh, almost insuperable problems that ordinary people are facing under the current economy. Um, so he did, went through the signs and he did, you know, sort of com some computer geek, um, you know, sort of counted up the words and, and um, he discovered that the word that's used most is jobs, word number two was debt, um, so, and so forth and so on. Did the top 20 words and he said, well, the fascinating thing is that nobody here is demanding dignity of work. They're not demanding workplace democracy. Um, it, you know, they're demanding the means to exist. Uh, in, and he actually went back to a quote that I had taken from Moses Finley. What is that? <laughs> um, a quote that I had taken from Moses Finley that, you know, in the ancient world, the sort of there's one revolutionary program, which was essentially cancel the debts and redistribute the land. Um, which is, he said, the demands of a peasantry, not of an industrial proletariat. Um, you know, basically saying, just give us the means for a ba uh, basic existence. Uh, now, the reason I thought this was interesting is I started looking at it, you know, and I thought, well, yeah, but this shows the kind of limit of this kind of statistical word count analysis, no matter, yeah, I'm almost done, uh, no matter how so, uh, sophisticated, because if you look at the actual signs, um, there's more, something really profoundly more going on here, and I want to introduce this. Um, first of all, 80% of the people who contribute to this page are women. Um, and almost all of them, including the men, are involved in what you might call the caring or helping industries. Uh, they're in education, they're in um, medicine, nursing, doctors, uh, they're in social service provision of one kind or another. And the message that I saw over and over again is a justification of that kind of work and a complaint that essentially if you want to do a kind of work where you're caring for other people, if you want to do a work where you're not simply in it for the money, where you're doing something decent and taking care of other human beings, they will put you so deeply in debt that you can't take care of your own family. I think that's the complaint and that's the thing which is drawing people together across the board. And to understand what's happening, I think just that kind of a reimagination of what labor is, what production is, um, is a necessary starting place to understand uh, the profound revolutionary changes that are happening in America today. So let me let throw me, that at you and see where we go. Uh, let me just add to that. I mean, one of the organizations that sprang up uh, both nationally and also here in New York City was the Excluded Workers Congress. Now, this strikes me as a great idea. Uh, you're talking about workers that includes the domestic workers, it includes the taxi drivers, it includes the, all of those workers who actually play a, a very significant role in, in supporting urban life, uh, foundational. Mm -hmm. And uh, yet uh, they can't be organized in traditional unions because, uh, you know, there's no factory gate about outside of which you can sort of catch them and get them to sign things. and and, and uh, you know, there are these organizations, and of course, uh, it, it disproportionately involves uh, women, and particularly women of color. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you kind of get a sense of what the conditions under which that population live. I mean, when I came back from Argentina a couple of weeks ago, I came in at Kennedy Airport at 6 o'clock in the morning, and I get on the E-train coming in from Jamaica at 6.30 in the morning, and it's packed. It's absolutely packed, and it's packed mainly by women and women of color, looking absolutely exhausted, going into the city to wake it up so that the suits can come in and everything is nice and smooth, and they can, you know, they're either going to take care of the kids or they're going to do, you know, something of this sort. And, and those, that's the population when you start to look at distribution of income in New York City. I mean, this recent study was absolutely uh, uh, astonishing. Uh, that uh, there's a million people in New York City trying to live on $10,000 a year. Half of the population of New York City is trying to get by on $30,000 a year. And, and uh, you know, they have no right to the city at all. They have no right to anything. And yet they are the labor, in many instances, they are the labor force which actually supports daily life in the city. And the calculation is that the 1% actually earns in one day 
that ten thousand dollars, which some people are surviving one year. Now these class disparities, which have grown hugely, are and this is one of the great success stories I think that Occupy Wall Street from was far from watching it from far away. So it, it changed the conversation about social inequality. So now there is some attempt, it seems to me, by the Democratic Party at least to take that up, and I don't have any faith <laughs> in it. I know you don't either, <laughs> but, but, but they're, they're trying, they're, at least they're trying to co-opt a little bit of that, and, and thank God we're now talking about social inequality rather than talking about, you know, the austerity, terrible, austerity yeah. and the debt, you know. I mean, at least, at least it's changed the, 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 the conversation. And uh, I, I was amused, I, uh, in the newspaper this morning there was some item, I didn't, either Obama is proposing a law or is signing a law that says that people should not trade with any government which suppresses dissent. <laughs> New York City, you're in a really rough time. You're going to have a really rough time uh, very soon. You know, I mean, uh, these are the kinds of things that it seems to me we have to, you really have to build upon uh, the, 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 the ludicrous uh, uh, hypocrisies that are, that, are, that are in the conversation uh, right now. But just going back to something, you know, uh, the May Day thing is being done partly in collaboration, I guess, with the immigrant rights thing. Um, one of the significant urban events was back in 2006 when the immigrant rights were, stuff really started big time. There was this proposal in Congress, if you recall, to actually turn uh, illegal immigrants into, into felons. And, and that set the immigrant populations off, and the immigrant populations decided they were not going to go to work on several days in that year. And, and during those days, essentially, you know, Los Angeles closed down, Chicago closed down. There was serious, and this is a tremendous power. Now, if you say the proletariat is everybody who produces the city um, and, and reproduces the city, uh, one of the things that, you know, if you want to be theoretical about it, Marx says anybody who transports anything is productive of value and all this kind of stuff. So all of those vans that are going around New York City delivering things and pressure, they're actually part of value-producing labor. They are part of a proletariat. Now, transport workers' strikes are actually pretty effective. The French used it several, you know, several oh, times yeah. mm -hmm. over the last few years. And, of course, it was used negatively in Chile way back in 1973. So, so, so if you stop a city functioning, this is a tremendous power. And this is what happened uh, in one of the examples I use in the book, which is El Alto, mm -hmm. which actually stopped the flow of goods into La Paz and, and, and brought down two presidents in, in the space of about two, three years and, and paved the way for Morales to be elected. Now, Morales has kind of compromised in all sorts of ways with the neoliberal project. Uh, we know that. But on the other hand, this was a revolutionary moment when actually the organization of a whole city actually had a tremendous kind of, kind of, kind of impact. But stopping a city moving. Now, in that sense, I always go back. I, I arrived in this city just shortly after 9-11, and one of the things that struck me was what happens when a city stops moving. Mm. And, and small wonder, about three days into it, uh, you know, Giuliani comes on and says, start shopping, go out, get moving. Mm. I mean, you can't, mm. you know, because capital is about continuous flow. It's about, it's got to be in motion. If you stop the motion, you've really stopped the whole system. And, and you, you see fortuitous events that tell you the same thing. I mean, the cost when those, vol those Icelandic volcanoes erupted, mm. uh, you know, and suddenly yeah, you couldn't fly across the Atlantic. You know, you, so, so you've got to think of the city strategically as a space in which you can act and, and do things uh, which will potentially be disruptive uh, to the flows of, of, of capital uh, and transform, if you like, the metabolic relations of the city. Now, if you take that path, of course, you're going to hit police repression and you're going to hit a police riot, but then a police riot doesn't necessarily clear the city either. Uh, it can uh, also close it, close it down. So there's a lot of power which, which resides, it seems to me, in, in thinking about the, the urban as a, as, as, as a place to organize, 
uh, and as a place to, to come back together. And I, I think you're, you're dead right about, for example, my impression is that there are quite a lot of segments of the union movement right now that are prepared to change, I think, their stance. Uh, since the publication of this book, I've been approached by some segments of the TUC in Britain saying, we just looked at your book, we want to talk about it. And, and actually the trades councils in Britain, which were sort of geographically specified, had a much stronger sense of organizing a proletariat than the sectoral unions did. The sectoral unions typically said, we're going to look after the mine workers, we're going to look after the metal workers, and we don't care about anybody else. But if you're a trades council and you're looking after all of the, all of the workers in Oxford or all of the workers, you know, then, then actually you start to say, well, what is the proletarian condition? And you start to be concerned about conditions of life and housing and the sewage and the sanitation and all those other things that, that actually, actually affect things. And, and of course, the, the labor councils in, in, uh, uh, in this country uh, really have traditionally been regarded as rather secondary instruments within the labor movement, but I think there's a stronger sense now with some elements within the labor movement, Bill Fletcher and other people like that, sort of arguing, well, we should be really, uh, and Bill Fletcher was the one who proposed to, me the, proposed to me the question, how do you organize the whole city? And I said, Bill, I have the faintest idea how. <laughs> But this is something we sh clearly should be thinking, thinking about, and we have to think about it in, 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 this, in, this, uh, in this new way. So that, that to me, seems to me to be, uh, you know, just to re reiterate some of, some of the, the arguments that occur within it. And, but I would like to backtrack just a little bit to say that the other theme in the book is to realize how significant urbanization is in the history of capital accumulation. There's this wonderful statement that came out of the San Francisco Reserve Bank that says America gets out of crises by building new houses and filling them with things. <laughs> and actually, since the 1930s, that's what they've done. Actually, you look at the data since the 1930s, that ineffectively is how the United States has been stabilized. For the first time, housing construction went below the one million, you know, way, way, way down back to 1940s levels in 2009. And Again, it's an end of an era where, where you can get out of crises by building houses and filling with them things. You, we cannot do that in this country at this time. It's impossible. There are so many surplus houses around. You, you, can't, you, can't, you can't do it. So, so recognizing the importance of the urbanization to capital accumulation, uh, what we see is a certain blockage to getting out of the crisis through an urbanization project. The one part of the world that is doing that big time is China. Mm -hmm. And, and they're, they're booming at 10% because they can, they're building cities at a crazy kind of rate. Uh, but again, there's a great deal of protest uh, being organized uh, around that. So I, I'm kind of very hopeful about some of, uh, some of this, but I've, I'm still bothered somewhat by the scale question. So I wonder, David, if I could ask you to talk sure. a little bit more about how, how you th think th mm -hmm. this kind of question of organizing at different scales might be, be approached as a, co as a conversation. What would, mm -hmm. what would be the talking points? Not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not asking you for a solution, I'm just sort of. Uh, just before you begin, maybe okay. if people could, with questions, could uh, pass their cards down to the end and we'll begin to collect them and collate them. Mm. Well, yeah, um, I mean, essentially, on, on the question of scale, I think that when you talk about horizontality and hierarchy, you know, we're talking about issues which everybody has to grapple with on some level. And I think you're right that there has been a reluctance to talk about some aspects of that in realistic terms, partly because people want to take a principled position and if they aren't faced with an immediate problem, which will cause them to um, r recognize that some of those principles will have to be at least moderated in practice or um, become more complex in their application, well, why think about it if you don't have to? Um, so so I, I am actually a avid devotee of, devotee of, of, of the notion of horizontality, um, but I see horizontality a little bit um, like the way that someone like Noam Chomsky talks about anarchism as being anti-authoritarian. He says that it's not like there is no possible form of authority that will ever be legitimate. 
Um, for example, I see the authority of a teacher as being something that will always exist to some degree or another in any society. Now you've become a teacher, you said. Well, yes, but <laughs> <laughs> I thought that even when I wasn't. <laughs> um, I liked my teachers. Uh, but um, maybe that's why I became one. <laughs> but, um, but, but it's because you know, authority of a teacher is essentially self-destructive authority, right? Uh, if you teach well enough, you no longer have the authority because they know everything you used to know. Um, now, however you frame it, though, I mean, at Chomsky's point, I think, and others have said the same thing, is that it's not, being anti-authoritarian doesn't mean you say all forms of authority are necessarily always going to be legitimate. You're, you say you start from the assumption that they're legitimate unless they prove to you otherwise. Um, so I think it's really important maintain that principle of horizontality in the sense that really all relations should be horizontal unless there is an absolute proof that you need to have some sort of less horizontal um, organization. And the word vertical is a little ambiguous here, and the word hierarchy is a little ambiguous here, and part of the problem, I think, really does come down to language. Um, the word hierarchy can be used and often is used in two different ways which we conflate. Um, one of which is the notion of taxonomic hierarchies, nested hierarchies, as we talk about in the book. And it is certainly true that once you go up onto any sort of larger scale than a local face-to-face com -face community, um, you're going to have to have a, a notion of levels of inclusion, and, uh, which you know, are a form of hierarchy in one sense of the term. But um, what anti-authoritarians object to is not the notion of you know, uh, nested hierarchies in that sense, what they object to is the idea of linear hierarchies, so not hierarchies of inclusion, but hierarchies of exclusion. But what happens is that over and over again, hierarchies of inclusion become the basis for hierarchies of exclusion. So you have more and more inclusive levels, but um, those people who become the representatives of those more and more inclusive levels become exclusionary groups, which are thus become sort of set apart from the people that they represent. The question, of course, is how to make sure that doesn't happen. And historically, there are approaches that have been used. I actually think that we haven't really examined history closely enough to think about the ways that it can be done. There are people such as an Alto, um, uh, Zapatistas, um, with the notion of recallable delegates. So this is rotation approaches that have been experimented with. I think there's a lot more things that we w would probably want to think about. One thing that really struck me recently, the other book I read recently, uh, was a book by a French political theorist named Bernard Manin, um, who wrote a history of representative democracy, who pointed out that the notion of elections through most of Western history were not considered the democratic mode of selecting leaders. It was considered the aristocratic mode of selecting leaders. Because, you know, a, a election is between people who would consider themselves the best, and then you choose which one is best of all. Um, the democratic mode of selection was uh, lottery. Uh, basically jury duty, except it's voluntary, you don't have to sign up. You throw your name in the hat, they give you a basic competence test, and then they just choose the name. Um, and Athens actually did that. Uh, Florence, um, other democratic systems have act operated quite successfully with this for hundreds of years. Um, so there's a lot of different ways you could organize these things which would prevent the obvious problems of linear hierarchies emerging. I think we haven't begun to explore that, so I don't think that's so much a problem. What I think a problem is, is how to get there in terms of, I mean, we both take this on. Um, you know, if you haven't destroyed the overarching capitalist world system, um, any enclave is going to be inherently compromised. The real question is one of how to organize a dual power situation. Once you've achieved autonomy, how not to have it immediately compromised by having to exist and you know, have access to basic resources within a system which is essentially rigged against it. Um, there are a lot of different ideas about this, but at, um, in my recent book, which hasn't come out yet, I actually uh, map out four different possibilities. And this is really a way of getting to start thinking about the question, but it might be useful. Um, I call them the, um, the Sadr City approach uh, to dual power, the San Andres Accords approach, the El Alto approach, and the Argentine approach. Um, so if you are creating prefigurative institutions, alternatives, whether on a local level or an urban level, um, whatever level it may be, how do you relate to the larger power structures? Um, well, what we saw, actually groups like um, Hezbollah in Lebanon, 
the Sadras in um, Iraq. Actually, a very interesting approach to dual power. Um, it's not as often explored as such as I think it should be. Uh, so Sadras did, for example, they knew that if you're going to create alternative institutions, what you have to do is you have to start with something that no one could possibly object to something so obviously benevolent that no one could complain about it, and then build an army to protect it. So what they did was they started with um, free clinics for pregnant and nursing mothers, pregnant women and nursing mothers. Uh, you know, who could possibly object to that? And then they built a militia system to protect it, and sort of created a, gradually created an infrastructure where they came to dominate uh, urban neighborhoods. The problem is how you then relate to the larger, um, larger national system. And, and uh, gradually, almost inevitably, they got drawn into local politics and then into um, national politics. This happened in the Middle East wherever the sort of right-wing populists um, did that. So this seems to be a pitfall, um, not, uh, not the direction I think we would want to take, but we want to throw that as the first one. Uh, the second one was um, uh, the Zapatista approach, which I thought was actually quite interesting. The San Andres Accords, they had a brief week, basically 10-day insurrection. Uh, quickly said, okay, we're going to negotiate. Um, they had these autonomous self-governing communities. And what they essentially did was they had a prolonged negotiation with the government, even though they knew the government was negotiating in bad faith and would never enforce the treaty, simply because the process of negotiation allowed them a space in which to develop their own autonomy, an excuse to have democratic consultancies and actually to build up their democratic structure. I'm not sure what an equivalent of that would be for Occupy Wall Street, perhaps some sort of um, constitutional amendment or using some sort of process where we don't have to endorse candidates. Um, the El Alto approach, I think, um, is more sophisticated, but we'd have to get there. Um, what that may, and you know, what's really interesting, if you read the writings of not Morales so much as his vice president, he writes quite explicitly that this is an experiment in dual power. Um, what they're trying to do, they have groups like El Alto, which are self-organized communities. And on top of that, they have a political party, which they've placed in power, but could just as easily remove. Because what you do is you, you develop you basically change the terms of engagement with the state, where these self-organized communities have the power and the legitimacy to use forms of direct action to overthrow governments if they have to, essentially stage insurrections. And then you say, all right, we've got our guy in there, and we know there's structural constraints on anybody with government. They'd have to make all these compromises with, with the world system, with the local bureaucracy, which is not set up to be democratic. Um, but that's OK, because we can kick them out of power at any time. And um, you make sure that they know that. You make sure that everyone knows that. And that in itself gives a certain power to David Morales to stand up to the authorities. Because you can say, well, look, my constituencies could kick me out at any time. Uh, of course, in order to get there, um, this is what I say to Occupy Wall Street people, you know, we can enter the political process, but only once we've changed the terms of engagement to, where insurrection is legitimate in America, then it'll be OK. The third, the, uh, fourth approach, which I think uh, is what? we're doing now as a default is the Argentine model, which was successful in its own way, which is utter delegitimation. I mean, the one ace in the hole we have is that most people don't consider the government particularly legitimate anyway. If I um, remember the statistics I was seeing the other day, a larger percentage of Americans would like to see the US become a Soviet communist system than approve of Congress. Um, it's, it's that, which is actually shows that interestingly, that, 10% of Americans actually would accept the Soviet communist system, but 9% um, approve of Congress. Um, uh, so, you know, most people hate politicians and think they're corrupt anyway. So the Argentine model was essentially you have your insurrection, you overthrow the government, um, you create alternative institutions, you know, the, the famous slogan was que se vayan todos, so they can all go to hell, roughly translated. Um, all reject and it got to the point where politicians basically couldn't go to restaurants, this is your aim, uh, without having to wear phony mustaches and things like that because people would throw food at them. Um, so once you get to the point where the entire political class is delegitimated, they have to do something. And what Argentina did, we all know, they defaulted on their debt. And Nestor Kirchner was like not the sort of person, you know, incredibly moderate social democrat, um, comes into power at a point where the entire political apparatus has been utterly delegitimated. He kind of has to do something radical. Um, we could create a situation like that. It's probably the most practical thing we could do with the balance of forces existing as they are in America. But it's kind of the default strategy. And I think the other models provide interesting possible directions of how we could work from there. So let's, let's start with that.
All right, so we have a bunch of questions. Actually, I have a question first. Where exactly do, uh, where do the suburbs figure into this? I mean, America is mostly suburbs. Well, that's part of the ruinous capitalist urbanization that I, that I talk about. And, uh, you know, uh, while the right to the city is a good slogan, the right to the suburbs, yuck. Uh, On the suburbs, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it, it's, uh, you know, I mean, this is, this is part of the, 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 I mean, there's a, when we talk about the right to the city in particular, there's a real question as to where does the city begin and end. You have the suburbs, you have the peri-urban stuff, and uh, there's a complicated thing to talk about. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, I have a whole pile of questions. We'll try to get through as many of them as possible. Uh, so here's the first one. Uh, given that immigrants are, one, an important section of uh, the labor force, and two, that they're largely undocumented, therefore not organized as unions, um, what kind of role can they play, uh, or have they played in movements like Occupy Wall Street? Oh, it's, you know. Well, I don't think, <laughs> I mean, you talk about Occupy Wall Street. I've already talked about it a little bit, yeah. Yeah, but uh, I mean, I think the, uh, what happened in those immigrant rights marches back in uh, 2006 was a lot of the undocumented didn't go to work <laughs> and, and a lot of businesses had to close down for the day, you know. So, and, and actually what's so interesting right now, you know, you, you see reports from what's going on in California and a lot of the agricultural, uh, they, they can't get the labor right now to pick the fruit and, uh, and in fact uh, businesses are really suffering from the fact that the, this tightening of the immigration laws is, is actually creating all kinds of disruptions to, to, to capital accumulation, which is very curious side effect. So I think they have a lot of a lot of potential a lot of potential power, but of course it's very difficult to exercise. And that's where I think the leadership of the legal migrants becomes absolutely crucial uh, to sort of providing an umbrella situation under which many of the legals can can participate in some way. Um, can independent political parties play any valuable role in freeing people from onerous debt, rent, etc.? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I'd like to see them try. I'm, I'm, it's not my, I'm, I'm an anarchist. I don't do this myself. But um, the American political system is rigged to make it as difficult as possible for that to happen. But there are things that can happen on a local level, I think, that can't happen on the national level, which I think we, we, we should think about. Um, yes, I had the somewhat uncomfortable position earlier today when I'm wearing this silly costume for that they trundled me out of the last moment with the green candidate for president. And I was like, oh, great. <laughs> there goes my anarchist creds. I know no one told me about this. Um, we got kind of ripped up a, a check together. Uh, but I think that um, you know, political parties serve a propaganda purpose more than anything else. Um, because it's almost impossible for political parties to actually gain national traction. The entire system is, is built up in such a way that it, um, you know, we have to remember that the, the political structure that we have is a structure that was created to prevent democracy. Um, this is what people don't remember. That, uh, that I always like to annoy people by pointing out that nowhere in the Declaration of Independence or um, the Constitution does it say anything about America being a democracy. Uh, people who wrote those documents hated democracy. They were utterly against it. Um, in fact, I remember seeing a quote from John Adams who was very explicit, majority vote. We can't have a majority vote. The first thing they'll do is they'll abolish the debts and redistribute the land. Uh, he read a lot of classics. Um, but um, so they set up this system to like, you know, basically prevent democracy. And then in the 1830s, they renamed it democracy because people got elected on that platform. And uh, so suddenly everybody was a Democrat. Um, but it's a system that's really designed to make it as difficult as possible for democratic voices to actually work through the system, even before it became a system of pure institutionalized bribery. Here's a question about uh, organizational forms. Um, so you mentioned Murray Bookchin in your book, In Rebel Cities. Uh, what do you think about his notion of confederated general assemblies or, or popular assemblies as a way of, um, as creating a form of dual power. Yeah, I'm, I mean, your position, you know, I, okay, I'm, I suppose I'm known as a Marxist, but as a, as a geographer, I'm, uh, the tradition is anarchist. I mean, uh, Elise Reclus, Kropotkin were all geographers, and of course, 
they had great influence on many of the urbanists like Patrick Geddes and then Lewis Mumford and mm. so on. So a lot of thinking about cities from a radical perspective has come out of the anarchist tradition. So I have a lot of admiration uh, for some of the works of uh, Murray Bookchin because he takes on some, some of these, these, these questions. Um, I also have some, some criticisms and so I often feel I'm in dialogue uh, with him because um, I think, um, as I recall it, and you probably tell me if I get this wrong, the Federated Assemblies are supposed to be really about, this is a San Simonian notion, they're supposed to be about the government of things, not of people. Mm. Okay. And, and, and uh, that seems to me to be a very difficult divide to, 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 main, to maintain, particularly when you, you get into the question of uh, the global commons and, and how they can be, can be managed. Um, if, if there are problems in the global commons, and we see that in something like global warming, uh, then there are things that may need to be done which do actually intervene in the way in which people behave and, and have impacts on how, how people behave. I mean, that's where you get into this kind of question, is it all from the bottom up or is it, is it going to, you know, what's the, what's the balance between mm -hmm. the power relations? And uh, in the, uh, I once wrote a, a utopian sketch called Idyllia, which was uh, sort of an appendix to Spaces of Hope. And one of the points I made was that you probably need to have global commissions, at least to inform the population as to what the nature of the global problems might be, because uh, I don't think that anybody sitting in a, any particular commune somewhere would necessarily be aware of, say, a global process like uh, ozone hole or depletion of, 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 of biodiversity or those, those kinds of aggregate things. So there has to be some way of creating an information source that at least then poses these problems to action at the local level, which would then have considerable influence, I think, uh, over the actions at the local level and then what to do if uh, no action is taken at the local level because as we often know if you if you ask everybody to economize in some way or other then you do get a, a common issue which is I decide oh well I won't bother let everybody else do it and of course if everybody decides that then you get no action so if every commune decided for example that well it would not, it understood the nature of the problem, but everybody else was going to work on it, so that was all right. So there were issues of that kind uh, which uh, would, uh, would, would come up and they need to be thought about. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a question of technical expertise is um, often left out of this. And again, it's harder in that case to go back to the past because they had uh, options available to them that we don't anymore. For example, in ancient Athens, all the sort of technical, you know, the engineers or the technical roles that you needed to have permanent people, they just got, they just got slaves. <laughs> so, um, you know, there was no chance of their really taking on um, autonomous power, but we, we can't really do that. Um, I think that the thing about Bookchin um, that I would add is that Bookchin tended to dichotomize unduly. Um, and one problem with his work is that he has this tendency over and over again, if there's a sort of subtle problem, you know, what to do with lifestyle anarchism versus social anarchism, how do you square personal liberation with ultimate social liberation, he just say, well, one is completely good and the other is completely bad. Um, <laughs> you know, social anarchism is great, lifestyle anarchism sucks, this has nothing to do with it. Um, and he does the same thing with direct democracy and worker control. And I think this is what he law in his vision is that you know, he says, all right, there's a subtle question that we all have to handle in any sort of democratized society, which is how do you square the problem, uh, you know, one principle which says all those people engaged in a project ha should have say over how that project is done, and the second principle which is all those people affected by a project should have some say in, in how that project is done. Now, one of them, if you take it exclusively, leads to pure workers' control, the other leads to sort of general direct democracy on every level. Well, clearly, some compromise between the two principles has to be worked out. And it just seems reasonable. If there's a factory, then um, people in the surrounding community really don't care about their vacation policy, but will probably want to have some say over what they dump in the river. That only makes sense. 
Um, Bookchin kind of goes just one way, says, no, worker control is totally wrong, get rid of it, um, only direct democracy. Um, so there's an inherent flaw in the system which allows him to kind of create a purism which would never actually exist if people started really doing this. Um, so I think that what we would end up is a system of much more heterogeneous than anything that um, these sort of abstract theorists envision. A lot of the problems that will arise when we have like contrasting principles and have to square them in some reasonable fashion are ones we can't even probably imagine right now. But um, so these are really thought experiments, sort of like Paracon more than anything else. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, he, he, he said all Marxists are all wrong as well. So yeah, but it, but he was actually he was very he was very nice and actually extremely respectful to me a couple of times I met him, which was kind of a little. A little surprising. <laughs> I was expecting to walk in the room and hear him say, listen, Marxist. <laughs> but he didn't do it. No. I was quite surprised. All right, so a point of agreement between you two seems to be that stopping the flows on which capitalism is dependent is a goal uh, strategy for creating and asserting popular power. Um, what are the flows around which organization uh, or of putting on the brakes is even possible today. Oh, help. That's what it ends with. Help. Oh, OK. Help. Well, um, where do we start? You want to take that or shall I? I mean, well, you start. No. All right. I mean, I, you know, whenever while well, you're talking about the right to the city, um, you know Seth to Bachman, uh, the cartoonist, he has this wonderful poster he often does for us, um, which has a picture of a sort of tall building that turns into a raised fist at the end, um, and the slogan is, um, we made the city, we can shut it down. Um, and I think that you know, there's layer on layer where it's possible to do this, but the entire part of the big problem is that another element of work that we haven't talked about uh, is, is security work. I mean, we have insane percentages of our population doing what economists sometimes call guard labor, depending on how you define, you know, which is a supervising, providing security for, um, you know, everyone from doorman and right watchmen to police to spies to, um, to supervisors um, at work. Um, it's, it's a little like in the, during the Civil War, I believe for every three soldiers, there was like one guy to shoot them if they ran away. Um, <laughs> we have a very similar situation in capitalism today. Um, the, I think it's something like 20%, and um, the percentage of people involved in guard labor, surprisingly enough, you know, goes up the higher the degree of social inequality in the society. So a country like Denmark has the lowest level of guard labor. Um, America has one of the highest in the world, um, which is one of the problems that you know, a very large percentage of the proletariat are employed um, to physically threaten the rest of the proletariat, um, or the, those people who make the city. Um, there's a limited number of things. We, there are things that people can do because there is a degree to which if you are working, especially within the grounds of labor uh, organizing, there is a kind of a sympathy that you can get that you won't get otherwise. Uh, I've noticed this like, rather dramatically myself in the case of uh, sabotage and direct action. Um, police, you know, I, I, I was, I'm part of the IWW, and we've um, done actions where we've um, done pickets where you know, it's a bunch of black block kids who are exactly the same guys who might be like breaking a window in Oakland, dressed exactly the same with red and black banners, but they're IWW and they're picketing. And suddenly, you know, we're sabotaging trucks and the cops are kind of looking the other way and, um, you know, letting us get away with murder, um, which, you know, they would just immediately beat us up and put us in jail uh, if the same people had been doing that in a different context. So I think, there, I mean, ultimately there is a way to appeal um, on small levels that way. And we have to remember that at some point, this, you know, when we win, it's because they refuse to shoot us. The security forces will have to choose sides at some point. And that's going to be a key juncture. Before that, um, I think that we need to think very hard about um, how to operate within the confines of, a, of, of such a system. I think this, the the breakdown will happen largely because I actually honestly believe that capitalism can't really afford the degree of, of guard labor and securitization that it's created. And one of the big problems is they put all of their weapons in this like incredible level of militarization, securitization, and propaganda um, to the degree that they've created a system whereby anybody thinks that challenging the system in any way and block, you know, blocking the flows 
is inherently impossible. Direct action is impossible. Alternatives to capital is impossible. Um, the cost of doing that is so high that it's actually destroying capitalism. I'm personally convinced of this. Um, so the one thing that they've achieved is that none of us think that there's anything, can, uh, anything else is possible and there's anything we can do about it. Now we're watching the whole thing dissolve in front of us. And um, the one victory they've had is that we're all sitting here dumbfounded without any idea what we can do. You know, uh, I often think about uh, how successful Bin Laden was. <laughs> uh, that, uh, you know, the flows through airports these days are very, it's very expensive, tremendous cost. Uh, Homeland security now costs an immense amount. And we know we're talking about direct and indirect costs, which have been visited on the American people and actually globally through, uh, through having to sort of secure the flows uh, from in interruption. <clears throat> But there are other things I would think about. I mean, for example, the, when you think about the, the city as uh, the metabolism of the city, uh, one of the ways in which El Alto succeeded was it cut off the food supply into La Paz. And the bourgeoisie basically lives in La Paz, and the El Alto folk live up on the plateau, and they cut the food supply. So the bourgeoisie had to live on canned beans and things like that. And, this was very effective. Uh, and uh, so I think that uh, if you imagine a very sophisticated labor organization right back down the food chain from the supermarkets right back into the farms, uh, and that is well organized. And I think actually there are elements in the IWW that are trying to organize that. Absolutely, that, 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 that's that, our idea. That, that, whole, <laughs> that whole food chain then you would have considerable power. And I'm not talking about just blocking the whole thing and then sort of saying, well, okay, let everybody starve because we would starve too, and that's not the idea. The idea is to have a certain power over a flow in relationship to a flow in which you can exert that power and, and use it, for example. A lot of the people involved in that food chain are in, illegal immigrant workers and so on, but use, of them, yeah. use, that, use that power in that chain to gain significant benefits for, 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 for that population. At the same time as you use that power and you try to, you, you, then have, you, you then always have to sort of go to the final consumer and say, do you realize the labor conditions that exist right the way through here? So, so if there's some disruption and you cannot get your favorite vegetables because we, you know, we're cutting off the food supply, then sympathize with it. And, and actually, it's often not hard to, to develop that. I mean, I think one of the things that was key in the French transportation strikes was that the majority of the population sympathized very much with the strikers. Mm. And, and even though they were inconvenienced and they had to, I don't know, walk a bicycle or do some, find some other way of getting to work or not go to work or whatever, there was still considerable sympathy there. And I think the same thing um, has, has taken place in, in, in Chile with, the, with the, the student strike there. That uh, the recent polls, I was in Chile for one week, but not, I wasn't there also about it. it you know, about 70% of the Chilean population uh, actually supports what the students are asking. Mm. And, and this is, the, you know, and, and I think uh, the president's popularity rating is now about 20%, so it tells you this is having a terrific political impact upon the, the, the political uh, situation. And that, of course, is again a, a strike of occupation for a year or more in high, high schools and, and all of the public universities. And it's very solidarity and it, very, very sophisticated uh, uh, piece of, uh, of, of action. So w w w what's being looked for here are, are, are ways to organize and mobilize so that you have some power by saying, if we withdraw our labor, if we cut the supply, then this can be extremely uh, disruptive. And, and capitalism is extremely vulnerable, it seems to me, to any disruption of the flows. Uh, and, and so that, therefore, we should think about strategies to try to get power in relationship to those flows, not necessarily to just cut them off and then kind of say, well, we're going to walk away from it by, you know, I don't know, putting down the electric grid or something like that and then walking away, because that would be 
awful for everybody, and you probably wouldn't get any public support out of doing that kind of thing. But you know, find ways to, 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 to think about it. So there are lots of, uh, when you think about the, the, the metabolic condition of a, of a city, uh, then you can see lots of ways in which you can start to organize around that, that meta metabolism. It's also critical to have the potential to do things. It doesn't mean you have to actually do right. it. Right. Um, I mean, it, uh, for example, and this is a weird case I, I learned recently, one reason why the Zuccotti Park um, occupation was successful, why they decided not to kick us out right away, was um, I know a Rolling Stone reporter who talked to a lot of the police officials and other uh, city officials, was all those guys in the Guy Fox masks, um, they were convinced that um, you know, if they did evict, Anonymous would like hack their credit card accounts. <laughs> um, you know, just having any kind of plausible threat like that will change their behavior. <laughs> All right, so I'm afraid we're out of time. So this Already. one final question. <laughs> this isn't really a question. David Graeber mentioned Occupy Farms. Occup Occupy mm -hmm. Farms needs a van. <laughs> if you have a van we can use, please email occupy-farms at googlegroups.com. Very important. This is a great work they're doing. So if you have a van, <laughs> please email them. Yeah. Um, thank you to all of you for joining us. Please check us out uh, at the Haymarket Book Table. Are you guys signing books? Yeah, we'll some books. Yeah, they'll be signing books at the table. Thank you, David. Thank you, David.